when I got into political journalism. The Prime Minister, John Forster, had, was someone who had been jailed during the war for his pro-Nazi activities. And his brother had been convicted for providing naval secrets or attempting to provide naval secrets to Nazi Germany. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you subscribe in your podcast app so that you don't miss out on future episodes. John Mattison is a South African journalist who grew up in the suburbs of Johannesburg. In 1979, he was sentenced to jail for refusing to reveal his news sources. Mattison describes life as a journalist in apartheid South Africa as well as his meetings with some of the key South African personalities of that period. He met with several South African Prime Ministers, including John Forster, P.W. Bota and F.W. de Klerk, who eventually oversaw the end of white majority rule. Also included are details of several meetings Madison had with Nelson Mandela, the first black president of South Africa. We also hear about Soviet training for African National Congress leaders and the South African Nuclear Weapons Program. Now, I could really use your support to help me to continue to produce these podcasts. A monthly donation of $4, £3 or €3 via Patreon will really help and you will get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you are helping to preserve Cold War history. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If a financial contribution is not your cup of tea, then you can still help us by leaving written reviews wherever you listen to us, as well as sharing us on social media. It really helps us get new guests on the show. Special thanks to several listeners who left five-star reviews, including Louth23, Monster Kaylee Band and Mortificating. The interviewer for today's episode is Peter Ryan, and I am delighted to welcome John Mattison to our Cold War conversation. Probably a good starting point, John, is if you could talk to us a little bit about what it was like being a journalist during South Africa over the course of the apartheid years. Um. Well, it's quite interesting. There were over a hundred laws restricting what we could uh, write, and uh, broadcasting was totally under government propaganda control. But um, the paper I worked for, the Ron Taylor Mail in Johannesburg, which was the biggest morning paper in the country, uh, established a reputation for really standing up to the government. Uh, we used to talk to our lawyers every day. And we found ways to tell the story. And so I would say with hindsight, nobody could claim they didn't know what apartheid was. They got the story of apartheid um, in its broad strokes and and a lot of specificity every morning with with their bacon and eggs. Got it. Okay, interesting. And one of the episodes that I I did find out about in terms of your own background as a journalist occurred in 1979 during the height of the apartheid years when you were sentenced to two weeks in jail for not revealing a source that you had for an article. Could you talk a little bit about that episode? Yeah, well, the the issue was the South African Watergate. My, My my journalistic role was, was relatively small. I wasn't the, the Woodwind and Bernstein, but it was my newspaper <laughs> at that time that broke the big stories that actually ended up bringing down the government. But why they were so sensitive to my story was because uh, I exposed how the government was secretly funding uh, church organizations, Christian religious organizations, uh, to, in order to advance apartheid and undermine their opponents, particularly Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who at that stage was head of the Council of Churches of the country. And so I was charged with uh, refusing to know in my source. I got a, a, a short sentence, but the um, 
we had to appeal it, and I must say my newspaper backed me all the way. Uh, um, once I said I wasn't going to give my source, uh, I lost it at, at every level of court all the way to the final appeal court. Um, and the reason we fought it was because the two weeks is just the first sentence. You could then be charged immediately again, and you wouldn't be protected by double jeopardy. Uh, so I could then get a longer sentence. Um, and I lost right at the end, which and so my 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 case, the State versus Madison, is still the uh, precedent that journalists don't have as much protection as we'd like. But of course, in the uh, post-apartheid era, it's it's fallen into disuse. But uh, um, uh, I lost every appeal. But by the time the final appeal came up, I was um, I was a journalist in Washington. And I'd undertaken to return to prison. And uh, at that stage, Reagan had just taken office. And um, the South African white government had high hopes that they'd get a more friendly treatment from Reagan than they'd had from Jimmy Carter. And so I got a presidential pardon. John, I, I want to get to the elements around the Cold War and what was happening from a South African context. You know, I, as somebody who has studied the Cold War for years, obviously I do know that there was a lot going on in South Africa in, in terms of what was happening with the different political factions in the country and so forth. But I do think that the South African element took on a life of its own as it was featured in the Deutschland 86 series that came out in 2019. Probably a good starting point for this part of our discussion would be to talk about what you see as what were the key elements about the Cold War dynamic in South Africa. What were some of the main themes? What were some of the main pressure points? Yeah, well, w w the Cold War definitely was, a, was an important feature uh, um, after World War II. What happened re really was, it was really very uh, curious. In 1948, I mean, so the South African government had fought on the side of the Allies against Hitler. That was under Jan Smuts, who, of course, was the very famous prime minister who was close to Churchill and FDR and, and pe you know, people at that level. Uh, and he was very highly respected. But in 1948, he lost, he lost the election uh, he, and he lost his own seat. And the, the people who came into power were the, the, were the white Afrikaner Nationalist Party that had opposed the war and opposed South Africa's support for the war. And by the um, 70s, when I got into political journalism, the Prime Minister, John Forster, had, it was someone who had been jailed during the war for his pro-Nazi activities. And his brother had been convicted for providing naval secrets or attempting to provide naval secrets to Nazi Germany. So, uh, uh, you know, this was a, obviously a huge uh, shift. And, of course, the people who came back from the war who'd been, you know, heroes, uh, you know, their comrades had been heroes in Canada or the United States or Britain. They were now um, out of favor with the new government. But in the Korean War in 1950, South Africa still fought on the side of the Allies, and then we provided some, some planes and fighter pilots. Um, so that idea of, of uh, loyalty to the Allies and hostility to the communists was a great boon for the apartheid government, because in South Africa, and you know, this is something interesting, if you look at North America as well, the communists got a lot of things wrong, but on the issue of race, the communists in South Africa and I think in some other countries, Western countries too, were the first to really fought for, fight for the rights of black South Africans. The Communist Party was the first political party to, in the 20s to, to, to deliberately put a black South African uh, in charge as, as a black chairman of the, of the Communist Party. So... By the 40s and 50s, they were in alliance with Nelson Mandela's African National Congress. And, I mean, for me, the crucial issue, which I, I have in my book, God, Spies and Lies, was that uh, Nelson Mandela's generation, he and Walter Sisulu and his other colleagues, they were the first to become militant. This was after World War II. 
and to say we 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 got to end this this white uh, legally racist regime, and they went to the West for support, and it was because of the Cold War and the the notion that the South African government, whatever else you might think about them, was pro uh, allies and anti communist, that the ANC and Mandela and his people got the cold shoulder. On the other side. Uh, they, they'd worked closely with communists. I mean, Mandela himself started off his co- political career anti-communist and believing that the ANC, his political party, should not work with communists. Um, but he started to find that his fr- he, he uh, went to law school at the same uh, university I went to. Uh, how he got there is another complicated question because he had to get special permission as a black person, but he did go. And uh, he met white communists in law, law, law school classes who, who were prepared to risk their lives uh, to fight the government. And so he came to trust them, people like Joe Slovo, uh, whites and blacks and the, oh, people of Indian descent. And so uh, his attitude to, communism, to communists became far less hostile. And, of course, the ANC did get uh, support from, from the Soviet Union. Uh, including uh, including weapons at a time when the West still saw itself as part of part of the uh, anti-communist alliance with, with the South African government. John, at any point was Mandela himself a communist? Well, this this is a subject of a great deal of dispute. Um, there are a number of uh, sort of revisionist uh, historians or journalists who've written recently after he died that he was a communist, although he said he wasn't. And I think it's possible that he may have signed a, a membership form at some stage, or, or you know, but he or participated uh, among the communists. But for me, that's a misleading question because if you see his policies, um, uh, he wasn't, uh, you know, he in, in at no key stage did he do anything to undermine a, a democratic system. I mean, he was responsible. Uh, for the, for the constitution we have, which is admired more than any other constitution, perhaps for the Canadian uh, uh, among among liberal Democrats, uh, and he's responsible for that. So he, so and and also he um, he, he I, I mean there were among the ANC there were people who were more socialist inclined than he was. So whether he technically joined or didn't, I think is 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 not the key question, but he, he may have briefly been a member. He wasn't an active member. It wasn't. He always said that the ANC has to be the dominant figure, and any of its alliance partners, which did include the Communist Party, must be subordinate to the ANC leadership. And where that was challenged, he would expel people, including communists. Got it. Okay, great. So if we're talking a little bit about the Cold War dealings with the different factions between the West and the East. How did South Africa's governments post-Second World War, leading all the way up to the end of the Cold War, how how would you classify or how would you describe their dealings with Western governments, with NATO versus governments in the East Bloc and the Warsaw Pact? Yeah, well, you see, the, the South African government played on the argument that the Cape Sea route uh, was essential to the West in fighting the Soviet Union. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they argued that, that, that they were an essential component to fighting communism. And, of course, the conservative forces in the United States and, and Europe and Britain and so on accepted, uh, you know, uh, accepted that argument. Would you say that the the relations with the Eastern Bloc countries, such as the Soviet Union, the GDR, Czechoslovakia, Poland, were they were they active? Were they in any type of discussions, or were they effectively non-existent? Well, yes, you know, I, I mean, the the GDR and the other Eastern Bloc countries, including the Soviet Union, were supporting the NC. So. So ANC leaders went to, I mean, Thabo Mbeki, who was a later generation president of South Africa, um, he studied at the Lenin Institute in Moscow. He also studied at Sussex University in the UK. Um, and people did, so uh, um, ANC uh, 
figures did go to the Soviet Union for training. They also went to the GDR for training. I um, I was a journalist for National Public Radio for a while, and I went to um, Zambia during the uh, Cold War, and I met with uh, the people who were running the ANC's farm, and they were all trained in Hungary. Um, so, so those sort of ties were there. Now, as far as the government's con con concerned, government had almost no contact with the Soviet Union. But, uh, as you know, in that probably know in that period, uh, South Africa's business forces, uh, uh, the Oppenheimer family of De Beers and Anglo-American Corporation, were very powerful, and they controlled the world's diamond market. It was the most effective cartel in the world. And occasionally you would meet, see a member of the Oppenheimer family from Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, out at the Bolshoi Ballet in Moscow during the Cold War. So in other words, there were, there were links going on where, where the common interest of the, the, the Soviets uh, who produced a lot of diamonds and the South Africans who produced a lot of diamonds and controlled the world diamond market, they, they interacted. Um, but that was not a government thing. That was a business thing. However, what happened was in the 80s, there have been a number of books written about this, that um, in the 80s, in the Gorbachev era, uh, there, were, there were members of the Soviet leadership that were tired of supporting the ANC and started to look for a compromise and started uh, to put out feelers to the apartheid government in Pretoria. And that did happen in the 80s, especially after around about 8 o'clock. Well, that leads to an interesting line of questioning. Uh, first of all, I'm going to ask you, just on what you mentioned uh, a few seconds ago, what led some of those elements of Gorbachev's leadership entourage to be tired of supporting the ANC? I think there were different, uh, of course, first of all, as you know, I mean, I spent a lot of, quite a bit of time reading up on the Soviet Union, the last, the decline and fall of the Soviet Union. As, as you know, their economy was in trouble. So they were reviewing where they were spending their money. And, of course, the other thing was that the, the ANC had very little to show for their military activity in the years that they'd had Soviet support. Um, and the truth is, I think it's widely accepted, that the, so the, the ANC was never going to overthrow the white government military. It, it was a stalemate, but the st a stalemate that could go on uh, almost uh, forever. And so they were saying, if we, you know, we need to settle things, and um, and this this is not going to lead to a settlement. So, John, you talked a little bit about what you saw in Zambia in terms of how the ANC farm was effectively being the, the people were being trained by individuals from Hungary, and we do know that, uh, as you mentioned, that some ANC leadership members had studied in the East Bloc. Yes. If we were to talk a little bit about what some of the, the other key initiatives were that the Soviet-backed countries were doing with the ANC, would it, would it fall into elements such as intelligence gathering, broad military training, um, efforts to try and teach ANC members about how to be subversive in the context of the broader South African society? Yes, I, I, you, you re referred to that uh, series Deutschland, uh, whatever, which, which I saw, actually. It was rather interesting. But first, just to clarify, when I say hung, the, the, the ANC farm in Zambia was run by South Africans who'd gone to Hungary for training first. And rather, they were not Hungarians in Zambia. They, these were South Africans who, who'd, done all the, who'd learned Hungarian and studied agriculture in, in Hungary. Um, uh, I think intelligence, yeah, there was there, there was definitely military training and I'm sure and yeah and intelligence training. Um, that um, movie, I've I've seen a couple of movies that suggest uh, um, there's that other one. Is it called The Americans? About yes. uh, in in Washington where they have a South African that's helping them uh, uh, in their battles against Casper Weinberger and the Reagan administration. That seemed a bit far-fetched to me. I doubt they were operating there, but but there's no doubt that they were um, they, they were they were you know very friendly relations, and and they did accept some training. They did accept um, armaments, and of course the ANC. 
The other interesting thing is that in the 80s, the ANC was getting increasing support from Sweden and the other Scandinavian countries. And they were clearly trying to set themselves up as supporters of uh, of democracy in South Africa and opponents of apartheid and racism, but providing support that was not military. Got it. Got it. Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I as you were talking a little bit about some of the training that the ANC members might have had overseas. I I recall reading the biography of Tabo Mbeki a few years ago, and it talked about even after he'd undergone university classes in in the East Bloc, that he would regularly go on vacation on the Black Sea in uh, in Bulgaria and in Crimea uh, because of the fact that he had these great connections and was able to travel with his family fairly seamlessly to the East Bloc, even for leisure purposes. Yeah, I think uh, if you were an ANC leader, you had, you you had a, a, a handful had access to holidays on the Black Sea. Interesting. Well, let's flip it a little bit now to the other side of the equation, and that relates to the intelligence services of the South African government. John, to what extent was South Africa's intelligence agencies? working with those found in the West, if we were to think of elements like, such as MI6 or the Mossad or the CIA? Oh, for sure they were. I mean, the most famous case, of course, which has been written up in the New York Times and elsewhere, is that it, it seems almost certain that Mandela's arrest was a result of him being betrayed by a CIA agent operating out of Durban. Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah, it, it's funny because one of the things that at least some of the research I've done about this period as it relates to South Africa was that there certainly was a lot of collaboration going on, but the Western agencies definitely did not want that getting out to, to them. That was something that they wanted to keep very much under the table as deep as they possibly could. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, one of the things I discovered researching that book was 1976 was a crucial year for um, the, the Washington. At the start of 1976, uh, Kissinger and um, uh, Ford administration, as it was by then, were still backing uh, white Rhodesia, Ian Smith's Rhodesia. Uh, but there was a crucial moment, and I discovered the document uh, in the Gerald Ford Presidential uh, Library where uh, uh, then head of CIA, George Bush Sr., uh, uh, reports, uh, tells Kissinger that if we leave things, leave the white regime of Ian Smith in place in Rhodesia, it, the Cubans will come in and the, uh, uh, between the Cubans and the uh, forces of Mugabe, uh, the white government will be overthrown within two years. And that had a very dramatic effect on American policy. Kissinger took Bush into the president's office, and and Bush told uh, Ford that. And from then on, they they were willing. They decided. And Walter Isaacson, in his uh, memoir of uh, Kissinger, uh, has a really interesting passage where he describes in more detail that Kissinger was willing to, because Kissinger's embarrassed by his Southern African policy. But Isaacson said, you know, it was quite clear. He decided that if you're on the wrong side, get on the right side ahead of everyone else. Uh, and you'll manage, manage, you know, and take the, take the lead in it. And I think that, that clearly happened under a Republican uh, Washington. There, and that leads me to another question that I, I think is very apropos based on your experience in Washington. If you were to typify what you observed with the Carter administration – as it related to South African policy in the broader Cold War context, and then you were to think about how it might have changed under Reagan when he took office in 1981, how would you compare and contrast those two administrations? Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question because, I mean, I sort of came of age as a journalist in the time of the uh, uh, Carter uh, administration. And uh, remember, Andrew Young was the first black cabinet member ever appointed. He was the UN ambassador with cabinet rank. Uh, and they were reviewing their policy very much oriented around human rights. And South Africa was a prime example of that. Uh, 
And so they were shifting. Uh, and of course, this came after Ford and Kissinger. And they were really shifting towards South Africa. But, I mean, for instance, Andrew Young came out here and Steve Biko and others of the young black uh, activists sent him a message saying, we regard you as as bad as all the rest of the West. We don't even want to meet with you. And mm -hmm. uh, Steve Biko himself told me that he'd refused an offer of a, of a, uh, uh, a trip to the United States provided by the United States Information Service as a protest against their policy. But I think what that tells you is that the policy was, was, was moving. It came from a, you know, very conservative, pro-apartheid base, as you say, not too loudly, but definitely pretty clearly. And they were moving. And then Reagan came to power. And he decided, and, and under him, you had the Assistant Secretary of State, Chester Crocker, who implemented a policy called constructive engagement with Victoria. Yes. And I think one would have to say that Crocker was more sophisticated than Reagan on the subject and understood things a lot better. I knew Crocker quite well. And um, I didn't agree with his policies, but he was looking for a solution which would simultaneously get the Cubans out of Angola and the white South Africans out of neighboring Namibia. And that was uh, that was called linkage. And the Carter people and the, the Democrats were very opposed to link linkage. But uh, Crocker believed in it. And also it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a tool he could use to get Reagan and some of the more conservative Republicans on board. That if we, we, uh, we can be, we can get something out of the white South Africans, get a concession out of them. But in doing so, we get the Cubans out of Angola at the same time. And so th that was the sort of uh, Cold War quid pro quo he was looking for. And it's interesting because I think a lot of people it, through the passage of time forget the extent to which Cuba was involved in Southern Africa in the geopolitical and the military dynamics. Can you talk, John, a little bit about how much communist Cuba had in terms of forces in Southern Africa and, and what South Africa itself did to try and combat that? Well, I, I don't have numbers, but Cuba was very active in Angola uh, with, with its air force as well as other forces. And, um, the, the, of course, the South Africans' whole argument, as the, the, the defense of racism became harder, Harder. They, rely, they try to rely more and more on the idea that we're, we're, we're fighting communists. We're not fighting black South Africans. We're fighting communists. And so the Cubans, were, in a way, you know, were a useful, a useful um, uh, crutch for them. Um, but the Cubans were quite, uh, I mean, I think they gave them uh, air, air support that was, that, was, that was very significant because South Africa was already under an arms embargo from most Western countries. So they didn't have the latest equipment. So the, Cu the Cubans did quite well in Angola. Uh, and I think, as I say, that was the sort of thing that gave, gave Kissinger and Bush and Ford a, a, a right to. And you mentioned South Africa as a as a country that was facing significant embargoes and didn't have access to, say, the latest international military technology. But if I'm not mistaken, didn't South Africa start its own military development company? Uh, I think it was called Arms Corps, wasn't it? That's right. It still exists. It's called Denel now. Okay, interesting, interesting. Just going back to the Cuban thing for a second – what prompted Cuba, a country in the middle of the Caribbean, to decide it was going to get involved in the geopolitical matters in Southern Africa? I think that uh, for Castro and Cuba, it was really intrinsic to their ideology uh, to support to, to support uh, um, liberation movements. I mean, we had. Uh, I mean, I've met uh, since since uh, the advent of democracy when the ANC came home. I've met a number of of uh, ANC leaders who spent a lot of time in Cuba. The, the relationship between Cuba and the ANC uh, was, was a pretty strong one. So uh, where they got an opportunity to go into Angola, I, I think they were quite happy to take it. So I want to flip back to the, the South African military element for a second. And I, I think it's become fairly clear based on research that certainly – 
there was a nuclear development program that the South African government was uh, aiming to implement. How how much of that is truth, John, versus how much it might have been popularized in, in fiction over the course of the, the previous few years? Oh, no, it's absolutely true. Uh, we, we, the information has come out. We know it. The South Africans developed a nu- nuclear weapon, and their allies at the time were Israel and, I believe, Taiwan. Um, and there was a, a nuclear expl- test explosion uh, in the um, – uh, I think around about late 70s, or early 80s. And uh, I think Carter was still in power and Carter was very upset about it. So the Americans were not happy with this at all. But Israel was involved and, and I'm pretty sure Taiwan as well. And of course, by 1994, they had, I'm trying to remember if it was three or six uh, atop, uh, nuclear weapons, nu- nuclear bombs, and, of course, the agreement was to dismantle them. So right just before the transfer of power to the democratic government, uh, we agreed to, to, to disarm our, our entire nuclear uh, system under the auspices of the International Atomic Energy Board. Do you have any idea what the objective of these weapons would have been? Were there any particular targets that the South African government would have been considering that they felt there was a need for this type of weaponry? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I'm not an expert on nuclear, but my sense is pretty much like Israel's. Who are you going to target? This? It's hard to see who you would target, or, or Pakistan or India, but it does give you it gives you leverage to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, uh, how you could actually use it. I mean, I'm sure there were studies on, on with potential targets, but I don't see how realistic any of that could ever be. John, can you talk to me a little bit about the relationship between South Africa's government and the United Kingdom, which I think we can all agree was a very pivotal element of the Cold War, especially in the, the Thatcher era. era. Um, obviously, Thatcher was a resistor to sanctions against the apartheid government. What were some of the dynamics like when it came to perhaps not just commercial relations, but almost strategic defense relations between South Africa and the UK? Yeah, well, you know, that's very interesting because, of course, the United Kingdom allowed the ANC to have offices in London. And quite a lot of the exiled leadership were based in London. So they, they, and, and I, you know, it's pretty clear that the British intelligence kept an eye on them. And uh, there was certainly some cases reported where they worked with South African intelligence to keep an eye on them. Uh, but they allowed them to be there. Uh, these were people who would have been banned in South Africa and would not have, you know, who would have been arrested on the spot if they came to South Africa. And if you saw in this, you know, the re- recent Netflix series, The Crown, where Thatcher and the Queen are alleged to have disputed over how far to go with sanctions. Um, but by the end, uh, you know, Thatcher did accept that, that there needed to be, you know, she was very against Mandela and very against the ANC. But of course, uh, you know, her ambassador, Sir Robin Rennick, has been writing books ever since uh, defending her and saying she, re- you know, she really came to like uh, Mandela and uh, and 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 she was an important factor in the closing days of apartheid, um, and and Mandela recognised that, and he made a point of working closely with the ambassador, the British ambassador Robin Rennick, um, because Thatcher was the one um, Western figure with with influence over uh, the South African president, the last white president, F. W. de Klerk. And and that raises an interesting point if we go back to the states for a second because you you talked a little bit about constructive engagement and the the balance that the Reagan administration was trying to bring in in terms of promoting human rights but at the same time recognizing that South Africa was certainly an important piece of the jigsaw when it came to the the fight against communism when did the dynamic change in the United States under Reagan, or, or did it change? Because I always had a sense that there was a certain point where the Reagan administration decided that it needed to be focused more on the human rights elements and what was going on in South Africa from the standpoint of racial equality as opposed to keeping the, the bulwark on geopolitical developments and goings-ons. Well, 
look, I, you know, I wasn't a great fan of constructive engagement at the time. But, but, but I think what you need to realize is that the Republican Party was, and the Reagan administration was really very deeply divided with two factions on the issue. You had Crocker and I think George Shultz on the side of constructive engagement, but with some very clear uh, anti-communist demands. And on the other hand, you had a very strong faction, including William Casey, the head of the CIA, who really were talking to Pretoria, were backing Pretoria, and actively trying to undermine Crocker uh, throughout. And Crocker writes about that and talks about that in, in, in his book. Reagan was quite out of his depth. I mean, I was at a press conference at the White House where, where he, he, he made some sort of really ignorant comments. He talked about the problem of South Africa being all about tribalism, which was a gross misunderstanding. And uh, Crocker also actually at times is somewhat ridicules Reagan, even though it was his own president for not really understanding it. Reagan went into a meeting uh, with African uh, leaders and he said, as one African leader said to me, if you, uh, if you, Africa is like a zebra, if you shoot, it doesn't matter if you shoot the white stripe or the black stripe, the zebra dies. And of course, everybody in the room knew that meant Pip Werther, the white uh, foreign minister of South Africa. So it fell rather flat and, 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 and Reagan wasn't sensitive enough to pick those kind of things up. Oh boy! Well, uh, <laughs> that's 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 sort of one of those things where I think everybody sort of looks at the looks at their feet on the floor. <laughs> well, John, my 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 question for you would be: as we know, South Africa obviously was a certain uh, certainly an interesting arena and interesting theater with regards to the Cold War and Cold War dynamics, but. As we've talked a little bit about, there's probably more and more information that the broader global community is getting about this now with TV shows like Deutschland 86, bringing it more to the forefront. If you were to talk to uh, a group of Cold War aficionados or, or a group of university students covering the Cold War, what would you tell them would be the biggest surprise that they might find out about in terms of South Africa and the whole element of the Cold War? What would be what would be a fact or uh, something that, that would be uh, perhaps something that would catch them by surprise? So do you think the fact that uh, the CIA uh, um, gave away Mandela's whereabouts to, to the uh, South African apartheid authorities is a pretty big uh, surprise? I think that would be up there, yeah. <laughs> I, I think what people, you know, what people uh, do is they take everything by the values of the current time. But the fact is that, um, I mean, I was always very strongly anti-apartheid. It's been sort of the cornerstone of my personal and professional identity. But the truth is, you know, I mean, my, my whole family were against me in those days. The view of white South Africans and, and Americans, uh, when I got to Washington, the thing that first shocked me most was how many ordinary uh, Americans I met who I assumed would be a, uh, a, a revolted by apartheid who actually supported it. Uh, there were people who went to the South African embassy in Washington who supported it uh, more than the white the South African government's diplomats were comfortable with. Um, so, you know, there's always been that uh, that r racial and and ideological element. Uh, but But it was really... As I say, I think 1976 was a key moment that it started to shift, and that was in Republican times, just because they saw they wanted to be on the winning side. And, you know, Kissinger was nothing if not a realist. So moving away from the Cold War for just a second, I, I'd be curious if you could talk a little bit about Mandela. Now, you taught Mandela and some of his future cabinet colleagues how to handle television, how to handle themselves on radio. And you had obviously some private moments over the course of that period. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like working with Mandela and some of his uh, inner circle? Maybe talk a little bit about what they were like personally and what some of your key memories would be around that? Yeah, well, um, you know, Mandela used to say he was not a saint, and I can confirm that from personal uh, observation. <laughs> 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 he had a, you know, he was very disciplined. He had a temper. Uh, he did not like being messed around. He was 
what was really so powerful about him and what was so admirable about him was that he, he had focus. You know, the one story I would tell is, uh, you know, in his culture, talking about family matters, especially the awkwardness about his wife, was not something you did, especially not with younger people. But I, I had said to him that, you know, when you fight an election, you've got to, uh, uh, people need to know things about you personally. You can't avoid that stuff. And then there were others like Stan Greenberg, who later worked for Bill Clinton, who, uh, who then advised Mandela the same thing. And during the 94 election, uh, he took people to, to uh, um, Robben Island and he took them to his cell and he would tell them, uh, you know, what it was like and where the picture of when he was and so on. And it was very painful and difficult for him. And at the end of it, one of the, one of the camera people came and said, uh, Mr. Mandela, I'm sorry, but my battery went out. Can we do it all again? And, you know, you could see him wince, but he did the whole thing again. When, when I spoke to him, you know, I said this whole thing about you not being bitter seems a bit simplistic. And he said, look, the point is, it's not that I'm not bitter, it's that I don't have time. And everything he always said to me was just focus. He had to get there. His intention was to finish this project, to get us to a democracy and to make it uh, work. And so nothing really would deflect him from that. Um, I find it very impressive. He's also, he read very, very widely and thoroughly. I mean, you talk about the Cold War. When he was a youngster and he had reservations about um, communism, he went and read Karl Marx uh, and he took detailed notes. And then when he decided, you know, and, and he was you know, he was leading civil disobedience at that time in the 50s. And so he was reading Martin uh, Luther King and he was reading Gandhi um, and I believe even um, uh, Tolstoy. Uh, and then when he decided that, that, that you had to have certain preconditions for civil disobedience to work, there has to be a certain sort of moral threshold in the society, which he concluded didn't exist in South Africa. And he opted for a military solution. He then started studying von Clausewitz. So he was a very thorough guy, but he read not as an academic, he read as a, as a politician, as a political strategist. Um, uh, I, I always found him immensely impressive. You know, there were so many people you meet uh, as a journalist and they get less, you know, senators, congressmen, <laughs> presidents, uh, ambassadors, and they get less impressive the more you know. That was, yeah. the, that was the opposite with Mandela. Mandela was, was really quite something. And, uh, and the people around him were, I mean, the tragedy is today, his leadership, I mean, the South Africa's president, current president, Sir Ramaphosa, is popular and well-liked. I've known him a long time and I like him. But the caliber of the people around Mandela was really was exceptional and hasn't widely been repeated. Did you have any dealings with any of the apartheid era leaders, uh, such as de Klerk or Boda? Oh, yes, all of them, uh, wow. from Forster onwards. Well, could you talk a little bit about what it was like dealing with them? Yeah, well, you know, it was very interesting. Um, John Forster you know, who sort of believed in the jackboot. He'd come from the times when, uh, uh, when he, as I say, he'd been uh, supporting the, the German cause in World War II. Uh, he, he, off the record and in private, he, he would tell jokes and drink and so on, but he'd make sure he was never photographed with a, uh, with a glass in his hand. And uh, he, he, he I, I remember going to his political events, and you really had a sort of almost a Nazi feeling because the intensity, the emotion that was drummed up with the songs and the flags and the uniforms and the intensity was was enormous. Um, then you got uh, P.W. Buerta. Now, P.W. Buerta was not educated. He was a sort of first-year dropout from university. And he uh, had a chip on his shoulder and, uh, and came to look for solutions through a military lens, and he kept people afraid of him. The interesting thing about de Klerk, I mean, I had an interesting encounter with Joe Slovo and Ronnie Casserles of the ANC and the Communist Party just, just before Ma um, Mandela was released. And um, they said, oh, de Klerk is just like the rest. And I said, look, I don't know what he's going to be like, but I'm telling you he's not like the rest. What was different about de Klerk is, he had far more personal confidence. His father had been in the cabinet. His uncle had been prime minister. He was well-educated. He'd been in all the bodies of the 
ruling party all his life from childhood in the Boy Scouts, which was politicized and so on. And so he had a lot more confidence. He was much more relaxed. He could talk about you. He managed, he could, he, people interviewed him for hours and never got anything useful out of him. And that was his intention. <laughs> um, but he was able, once he took power, to, to listen to people. Uh, and everybody was telling him that the, the business people, the Brudebund, which we haven't talked about, which is a, uh, uh, it was a secret organization that had enormous influence on the cabinet and on government. And they, all the ac experts and think tanks, the sort of internal think tanks were saying to him, we can't carry on the economy. We can go on forever, but the econ economy will just be in steady decline. We'll never get loans again internationally. We'll never really grow. And uh, do we want to go back to war for the rest of our lives? And he was able to have the strength of character to say, and the, and the personal confidence to say, no, I, um, that, that's not a sensible option and I'm going to reverse it. Wow. Okay. Well, certainly some, some amazing exposure you had to some very large personalities over the course of your career, John. And maybe before we finish off, can you talk a little bit about the, the book that you referenced a little bit earlier that you authored, uh, just in terms of what it's about and, and what readers might be able to get from it? Yeah, so this was my first book. It's called God, Spies, and Lies, and still I think sort of the most important thing I've done. And I, I wanted to give people a feel because I felt that most books, you know, you write that book when you go into the bookshop and you, and you keep looking for the book and you can't find it, you realize you have to do it yourself. I, I'm, there are a lot of good books about South Africa, a lot, and they're coming out all the time, but I felt that there wasn't anything – it conveyed to you what it was like from all sides and what it felt like from all sides. And um, particularly knowing the journalists I did, some of the, uh, the journalists who exposed the terrible things we saw at the time, but also how they thought. And I mean, there was one journalist who was a close friend of mine who was a friend of Mandela's, and he had exposed the Brudabont. And he also then went on to work on the world at war. You may remember that series that was narrated by Sir Lawrence Olivia. And my friend Charles Bloomberg worked on and wrote two of the episodes of that. The one was the, the final one on the Holocaust itself, and the other was looking at uh, the Netherlands during the time of Nazi occupation, resistance, and collaboration. And he had that kind of balance, and he could see all sides of it, and he studied the Ph.D., Theses written by everyone of relevance to understand how apartheid level people uh, leadership went and studied and did PhDs in the Netherlands and they did postdoctoral research in Nazi Germany in the 30s and what they accepted. I mean, I don't take a crude view that they were not that the apartheid and Nazis were the same. It wasn't the same, um, but he he analysed those quite critically and so. Uh, I think there are some really good stories in there, but it gives you a feel for what it was really like throughout that period. And of course, what it was like to go from the apartheid era then into our democracy and the wonderful optimism we had and also the pitfalls which you become, what is going on and what we're seeing about the limits of democracy in South Africa and some other countries. And we have further information such as videos and links in our show notes, which will show as a link in your podcast app. Now, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast without the generous support of our patrons. However, I want to especially thank our Politburo level members who are contributing a generous 30 US dollars a month to keep us on the air. They are Tony Sowards, Sam Hardwick, Nicholas Butter, Jeffrey Jones, Matthew Comstock, Frederick Esposito, and Peter Ryan. Don't forget, if you like one of those Cold War Conversations coasters and help support the show, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. If you can't wait for the next episode, please visit our Facebook discussion group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War Conversation. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.